Welcome to the Security Weekly News wrap up for the week of 6 December 2020. Steam flaws, Zuck gets zucked, Black Mirror, Kerberos flaws in Windows, and I, I survived the 15th anniversary unlocked show yesterday. So we're, we are actually here, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. All this in show news on Security Weekly News wrap up. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Do you know where your organization's crown jewel data is, whose data it is, what it contains, and if it's flagged, tagged, and classified accurately? Defense In-Depth requires discovery in-depth. At Big ID, they help organizations uncover dark data, classify sensitive and regulated data, meet compliance requirements, and take action for data on-prem, in the cloud, and everywhere in between. Learn more about how Discovery In-Depth can change the way enterprise organizations find, classify, and protect sensitive data at securityweekly.com forward slash big ID. Increased attacks, skill gaps, talent shortages, expanding attack surfaces. Cybersecurity and IT teams face these real issues every day. CyberAfer Teams is the number one NIST aligned DoD 8140 and 8570 compliance certification and skills training platform. CyberAfer Teams makes managing teams easier, guarantees measurable training outcomes, and keeps your team's skills sharp to meet today's biggest security threats. And did you know 96% of the Fortune 500 have employees training on CyberAfer? CyberAfer for Teams, now you know. Visit cyberAfer.it forward slash solved to solve your team training challenges. Hello, I'm Doug White from Roger Williams University, and welcome to the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up Show. Uh, we'll talk about all the show topics for the week on Application Security Weekly, number 133. John, Matt, and Mike had John Delaradari, uh, who's the Security Solutions Architect at Qualys, and Mike Manred, uh, the CISO at Grand Canyon Education. The segment was about Mike and John's approach to web application security with a focus on web app vulnerabilities and you know what your external attack service looks like. It was a pretty interesting segment from somebody who's dealing with education uh, kind of side of things. On Business Security Weekly number 199, Paul, Jason, and Matt had on Sri Sundra, Sundaralingam, I can say that name, Sundaralingam from Extra Hop. Uh, Sri has uh, uh, been on several different shows here and there. Uh, this segment was about what happens when we return from the COVID void to some sort of hybrid home and office work after the pandemic. So, you know, all the new threats that this has created and so forth. I, I think this is a really interesting segment. I know a lot of people have been doing segments about post COVID. We are hearing about the you know, rumors of vaccines and things now. And obviously I don't think things, you know, some people think that everything is just going to go blink and everything's going to go back to normal. I don't think very many of us believe that. So you're going to have these home workers for good and you're never getting away from this ever again. Um, in the second segment, it's Darth Vader week. I, I mean, they had all these titles, but all their, their articles were led with this. Uh, leadership lessons, uh, compliance report, how to brief senior le leadership, uh, quite an interesting one. Focused leadership, compassionate leadership is necessary, but not sufficient. And, you know, sometimes you just have to choke out an NCO on the Death Star. I mean, you know, it just, it just works. But, I mean, maybe that's the Darth Vader part. Three steps to run more effective meeting, top security concerns, and cyber threats globally. So a massive uh, segment that they had on there with all these articles. Uh, but I was interested in quite a few of those. On the Security Weekly News number 87, Tim Mackey from Synopsys was my guest. And he came on and he and I talked about CFAA and the Van Buren Supreme Court case. Uh, both of us not huge fans of CFAA, uh, but this Van Buren Supreme Court case is certainly something that's ongoing uh, with that. So check out that segment if you're interested in that. Uh, on Security and Compliance Weekly number 55, Frederick uh, Jeff, Josh, and Scott had Padraic O'Reilly, who's the Chief Product Officer and co-founder at CyberSaint. Uh, and the segment was about how COVID and rapid digitalization have pushed risk and compliance teams to innovate internally. And some real life examples of this, so a pretty cool segment. Again, a lot of this COVID stuff, I know we, we've heard a lot of this, but it is starting to reach a new chapter. So it, it's something to start thinking about. Their second segment was about getting to know Flea. Uh, so Frederick Flea Lee is the, C, the C, uh, CSO at Gusto. 
and he's a great host addition to the show. So um, check that one out if you want to get to know him a little bit better. On Paul Security Weekly number 677 last night. Okay. <laughs> uh, this was a different show. It was awesome. Uh, it was a collection of three round tables, even though the table isn't round. But um, it, it, it was really uh, an amazing set of shows. So they had uh, uh, the Hacking Matters panel was the last one. The second one was the Innovative Blue Team Techniques panel and the State of Pen Testing panel. So all three of these panels had regular hosts plus a whole pile of, of awesome guests. And it was, it was really, really cool. Um, I mean, it was it was really a fun uh, show. So if you didn't get a chance to watch all those, it wasn't as fun maybe as some of the past like Xmas shows and some of the things that we've done where they had you know so many people in the studio. Uh, I remember a couple of those, and you see, if you watched some of those highlight reels yesterday, you saw some of those shows being being done where there were so many people around the table. But it was really really awesome uh, set of panels and some great discussions. Um, I, I think my only gripe with the whole thing was that the panels were probably too short. I, I mean, I you know there was so many people there with so many points of view, and, and all these famous people were there. So it was really really cool. So if you didn't get a chance to watch those, they will post those up. Uh, and one other thing I'll mention there, and I'm going to mention it again in a minute, is the Innocent Lives Project, the the, the, the Hacking Matters panel. Uh, one of the guests from Innocent Lives. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Uh, but that brought the whole day to a close. So there was a Security Weekly Unlocked was yesterday, which hopefully you were attending anyway. Um, I mean, I, I know I will be watching talks from that for a while because there was three tracks that were running simultaneously and I was sitting in the Discord room for the strategy uh, and culture track. And there were two other tracks that were going as well as a demo track. And it was, it was really cool. Two awesome highlight reels that, that our crew put together. Uh, those, those were worth the whole day just to watch those amazing highlight reels. But thanks to the crew and everybody that put this inaugural con together. Like Paul kept saying last night, most of us were just being told where to sit and talk. And the people that did all the real work were un, un, <laughs> unrecognized. And there's, they don't even get like a set of credits to roll at the end of the thing or something. So check that out if you didn't get a chance to do it. Uh, I hosted a diversity panel, which was the single most intimidating thing I've done in a while. I did think it went really well. I was glad to see people were doing it. So if, if you haven't had a chance, they are going to post the talks. And that was the inaugural one. So 20 years from now, you at Unlocked XX, you can say, I was at the first one. And, you know, I, I was there. They had a cool trivia challenge as well. My favorite thread of the week this week was kind of odd. I was just trying to think about things that I had heard about. And I always try to think about, you know, what has been going on. One of the ones I was thinking about this week was obsolescence. And in, in this particular case, the obsolescence to which I refer is you. Um, I mean, there's always been discussion about obsolescence of software, obsolescence of hardware and so forth, but there's also the obsolescence of people. And I personally think one of the greatest challenges that I constantly talk about to students and clients and you is how the hell do you keep up with this field? Uh, and yesterday, again, I mean, every time I'm on these shows, I, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm hearing things, I, I'm learning things, and I'm like, wow, you know, this is intimidating. Um, you know, in computer science, you could kind of dig in. You know, you, you probably shouldn't, but you could, and just sort of be that, you know, C developer that sits in the corner of the basement for the next 10, 15 years and write patches or whatever. But you probably don't want to do that. And in security, it's just like, yikes, uh, you know, you've got the network, you've got the apps, you've got the compliance, the threats, the APT threats, the tools, the skill sets, and it just keeps going. And it's, you know, like every week there's a new tool, every week there's a new thing, every week there's a new APT with a new attack. And it's like, yikes. Now, I've been in this industry since the 1970s, so I, I wasn't really officially in it till the 1980s, but when I was a teenager, I worked as a programmer. But until the real security revolution started happening in the early part of the 21st century, I didn't really feel that fire hose effect that I feel sometimes now, where there's just literally a thousand new topics every week. And you just go, wow. I mean, I, I do two news shows a week, and I could just literally focus on any one of those areas and probably do a show every day. And all of us then have to keep up with at least some of this to some degree. So it's not a pitch for, for shows. It's a pitch for shows. It, it, it really isn't. But, I mean, you have to, it, it kind of is. But you have to find a way to get your info. 
and sort out the noise. I mean, I think that's really what the challenge is that I talk to my students about. I find it to be really challenging to try and just keep up with the acronyms flying around. You know, I'll hear a new one. I go, oh, what was that one? And, you know, once you get into rule changes, protocols, vulnerabilities, laws, best practices, and everything, since when you walk into that C-suite, they pretty much assume that you know it all, or at least they expect you to, and you have to act like you do. And, you know, I, I mean, I try to be on Paul, on Paul Security Weekly whenever they will let me be on because I don't think I've ever been on that show once that I didn't end up having to look something up or was sitting there thinking, wow, I, I really ought to read more about that because what the hell is it? And uh oh. And, you know, there was that one time, though, I, I might have been drunk on that show. I'm not sure, but it's possible. Anyway, wherever you are in your career, try and keep up. You really don't want to be that person who call, I, and this really happened, who called me and said, okay, I've been a COBOL developer for 22 years, and I just got laid off. What's this security stuff I keep hearing about? Yeah. And now the news. Uh, several special topics for today that I wanted to bring up. Uh, one, if you missed the announcement before Thanksgiving, or you missed it last night, or you've been missing it every time I've done it, Joff Thayer is doing a course called Enterprise Attacker Emulation and C2 Implant Development for a really, really, really low price. I, I, I was like, is that a typo? I, I really thought it was a typo when I first looked at it. Um, I did put the link to register for that class, which is in January. If you want to take a class from you know, Joff Thayer, uh, it, it's there. Two, if you didn't miss the show yesterday, well, be sure to check out all the recordings when they post them. Uh, or if you were there and you realized there were three tracks and you, you could only attend one talk at a time, same thing. So, you know, they will be posted. Three, the free holiday hack challenge is live now. Uh, it, it went live not yesterday, but I think it was Wednesday when, because uh, Ed Scotus was on last night, and I think he said Wednesday they did a soft rollout or something, and then it, but it's live now. So if you, this is Ed Scotus's and his team, and they do such a great job all year putting together the Holiday Hack Challenge, and it's free. So if you haven't uh, played yet, uh, jump in there, try to learn something. Uh, and you know, this year's a little different, so you probably won't get to get in that fist fight with your uncle in the front yard about whether the mayor is a communist or not. But you know, even so, have some fun with the Holiday Hack Challenge. And finally, uh, please, please go and check out innocentlivesfoundation.org. Uh, I put a link in the wiki. Uh, they were on uh, the final panel last night, and uh, this was really a great project. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it, it was only discussed at the end of that third roundtable session. So if you if you if you missed that or you 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 know passed out or whatever, you, you skip to the end and go watch it. But uh, this is an amazing group of people that that do a really awful job, which is chasing down child abusers and child molesters as a nonprofit. So they're, so Chris Hadnagy uh, started this, and it runs totally on your donations. So it, it is completely funded by that. Uh, and that is a really, really awful job to have to do. So watch the segment if you can. If you can, donate to the great cause. Uh, but at least go read up on what they're doing and think about that, and maybe you could help. Critical Steam Flaws uh, could let gamers attack your machine. Yikes. Uh, Valve released a patch on uh, Wednesday that would allow a remote attack to crash your local machine. Uh, it can also allow the attacker to take over the machine or even all of the machines that are connected to a gaming server. Uh, I, I really mention this not so much because of gaming and that gamers are listening to this show, but because all of us who are supporting systems, those home systems are connected to us now. I mean, we've, this is the COVID thing again. And as we've had to support this, Steam, Valve, I mean, I see that all the time installed on machines, and I, it's on one of my machines uh, because I was playing some game or something a while ago, but I mean, that is on a lot of machines, and those home machines are being used to access your corporate network. I know you told them not to do that, but you know, they're probably gonna do it. And this hybrid connection model is, is definitely a part of our lives to stay. And you know they're gonna connect to it anyway. I can't stand working that 12 inch screen on the fourth gen corp laptop they gave me when I have my monster machine loaded with two 3090 video cards and six monitors sitting right there in front of me and I'm working on a little teeny laptop that's got like kind of a sticky keyboard because I don't really know when somebody turned it in what they were doing with it. Um, but these flaws were found back in September and they're just now getting patched. Uh, there were four main CVEs in this platform, which are all in that article, uh, which related to Steam sockets. 
And so this is, of course, how Steam and Valve and all this stuff communicates, and particularly sharing with other people. So even if you don't use Valve and Steam, your employees probably do. And if they do, this is vulnerable. So you need to start. We, and this is something I think we're going to have a lot of trouble with going forward. Is like now we, we not only have a patch issue internally, we've got this sort of hybrid patch issue of how do I ensure that my employees are patching stuff in their homes, patching IoT. I and mean, I know we've talked about this stuff before, but it, it's an issue. The IRS is going to give everyone a pin for their tax return. Wow. In the past, this was not the case. You had to request one. I actually tried to get one once, and then they were like, well, you need to go through all these steps and all this stuff. And, and they would issue it if you could prove to them that you needed it. But this year, they are going to issue a pin to everyone in uh, January, so all taxpayers the re well that are registered the reason well it's it's really really easy to file fake returns so every year we go through this we've been going through it for a while so if somebody knows your tax id or your social security number and you know those are pretty well known uh the irs is recommend you know it, it, they take that and then they go in and they they file a tax return on your behalf and request a re you know they file a fake return get a refund and then have it delivered to some account in the cayman islands and, um, you know, and then you have a big problem. The IRS is recommending that you register on their site before that time. And I know it's an OSINT thing, but it, it's the IRS. I mean, they already have all your stuff anyway, and they're going to make you give them all this stuff anyway uh, because you have to pay taxes in the United States. Um, but uh, they're trying to get this pen established in January before all the cons start happening uh, leading up to the April 15th tax deadline. So it may be something, I, I really brought it up here mostly because it may be something you would explain to your people because we spend so much time warning them about OSINT and about giving up information. So you might want to review this and white paper it or put something out because it is a huge mess. I mean, every year I send out to my students about this, you know, all these tax return scams to tell them, pass this along to your parents and your grandparents or whatever. And you may want to pass this along to your, employee, your employees uh, because we know that, that people are going to be out there doing that. And trying to get out of this mess after it happens is just like a nightmare. I, I, it hasn't happened to me, but I know some people that it happened to, and it was just like a total zoo, as you might guess, dealing with the government and going and sitting in sticky vinyl chairs in fluorescent lit waiting rooms, hoping they'll eventually call your number. Zuck and Facebook are getting kind of zucked by uh, the government. So uh, the federal and state officials in the United States have now decided to claim that, like they did with Google, uh, that Facebook is a monopoly. And so antitrust is a charge that can be brought by the Department of Justice against companies uh, that where they say they have an unfair advantage in an industry. This is sort of one of those sort of capitalistic things. Um, but uh, basically with, the, with WhatsApp and Instagram, basically this $800 billion behemoth uh, that is Facebook uh, is now being claimed to be a, a monopoly. And they're kind of vilifying uh, Zuckerberg on this. And they, the article goes on and says that, you know, it's a Silicon Valley version of the Godfather and that Facebook can basically put the hit on competitors, which is kind of true. I mean, you know, it's like people try to get into this industry and when you've got this 800 billion pound gorilla sitting across the room that sort of says, I don't think so. And, you know, and they either buy you out, uh, you know, which is like that old, that old Simpsons cartoon where Homer's trying to get bought out by Bill Gates and Bill Gates just says, buy him out, boys, and they like knock him around a bit. But uh, the Justice Department did go after Google on similar grounds uh, this year as well. Zuck has vowed that he would go to the mattresses and fight. I, I think he said Matt. He would go to the mat and fight, which is, pr but going to the mattresses is a godfathery kind of thing, right? Uh, but the government has broken up entities in the past for this kind of thing. Uh, Bell Telephone, uh, their, uh, Standard Oil, there have been all kinds of cases where when those entities lost, they got broken up in some kind of government uh, deferral. And I guess that's the desired outcome is to force them to divest WhatsApp and Instagram into individual companies. Who knows? I, but I guess we'll find out, right? They have a lot of money and a lot of power. So we'll see how far this goes when, you know, Facebook decides to go to the mattresses with their $800 billion up against the federal government. Could be quite interesting. Uh, a Windows Kerberos attack was released to the public with a proof of concept by Jake Carnes from NetSpy. Uh, this was CVE 2020 and it was patched in the November Patch Tuesday. 
Uh, this attack is called a Kerberos uh, bronze bit attack. And basically what it does, it goes after two protocols that are part of Active Directory Kerberos, uh, the, the Kerberos protocol extensions. And it's the S4U2 self protocol, which is used to obtain a service ticket. So this is how Kerberos works, right? Kerberos gives tickets to devices on the network and it uses those encrypted tickets to validate who it's talking to. So this is an attack on that ticketing service. And if you can capture this, it will allow you to imper impersonate the target. So somebody gets a Kerberos ticket on an Active Directory network and that identifies them as something or other, and then you, in inter you can intercept that and you can create your own version of that. Uh, the other part of the attack uh, allows for privilege escalation by flipping a single bit. And that was where they sort of got this bronze bit attack. Since all this was, was sort of derivative of the golden ticket attacks and silver ticket attacks vis-a-vis -vis Mimi Cats and, uh, and so forth. So they called it the Kerberos bronze bit attack since there was already a gold and silver. Um, there is a patch uh, that came out in November, but you do have to install it in order to be protected from this pretty nasty thing. Uh, a new injection technique can allow the extraction of sensitive data from a PDF. Basically, Gareth Hayes presented a Black Hat Europe paper about the technique, and, he, and, and I, I posted a link to it there. And he said that you could inject escape objects and links into the P PDF using a kind of cross-site scripting attack and demonstrated that. He, Hayes used various techniques on some popular collections of PDFs, a PDF-libin and JSPDF, and then use JavaScript to steal the contents of those PDFs. I mean, he was using public PDFs. He was just trying to demonstrate this. This was doable. Uh, I really thought this was a pretty good read, and I definitely think you probably should review it if you if you think PDFs are some kind of secure thing that protects your content. So, I mean, I know some of you probably don't do that, but again, this may be one of those things where you need some more ammo to go back to the company and say, look, you know, this is maybe not a solution to all of our problems. And finally, um, NYPD. <laughs> NYPD now is one of those robot dogs from Black Mirror. Uh, it's the ones called Spot, you know, that, that are just like the creepiest looking thing. I mean, I really like them and I really, I really, really want one. So, you know, come on. I think Hyundai bought this company that makes these things now. But uh, they're super cool, and they're made in Massachusetts. So, guys, you could just loan us one. You know, we could have it in the studio. It could run around. Uh, but the NYPD really has one, uh, and, and basically this story is, is about how that the dog they have is going to get this special robotic arm attachment so that it can open doors. So, you know, no longer can you do it. Like in Black Mirror, you could close the door and keep them out. Uh-uh, that thing can just reach up and open the door. The dog has a max speed of about three miles per hour, which is not super fast. But, I mean, I can walk at three miles per hour, like on a treadmill. But, how? I mean, you know, how long can I do that? Um, it's got a 360-degree video camera, and it can carry up to 30 pounds. So far, NYPD has been really secretive about what they use it for. But they did say it was used in October in a case. And they apparently also reported that they used it as a waiter uh, in a hostage case in, in Queens where they were actually sending food and water into the people in the building. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I, police officers have to put themselves at risk to, to go into horrible situations. And if these robots make that a better thing, but man, are these things creepy. Um, Massachusetts State Police has been using the, one of these things since 2019. And they had some super creepy, super cool videos of the dog opening a door on a link. It's just the way it moves that's so creepy. You know, it's just got that like bizarre, but it's scary and fun. I mean, I want one. You know, I, I keep hinting about that. So, you know, if, if anybody up there in Boston wants to send me one, I, you know, we can have it. I'll keep it in the studio. I promise we won't use it. We might chase some interns with it, but may, we, we'll promise we won't. But, you know, that sort of thing. But it definitely has an ominous feel of sort of dystopianism about it. And, and of course, Black Mirror. I, I put a link to the Metalhead episode of Black Mirror if you want to see something that was really like foreshadowing all this. And that's a news wrap-up for the week of 6 December 2020 in the time of plague. Remember, there are only 13 shopping days till plague Xmas. Bye.